Okay, uh, we I believe that we have everyone present for this matter. Attorney Lundergren, I believe you represent the appellant. And did you wish to reserve time for rebuttal? Yes, I did, Your Honor. If I could reserve three minutes. Three minutes. Okay, I have made that notation. And uh, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Your Honor. And good morning to all of you. Uh, Amanda Lundergan, on behalf of the appellant, Suzanne Centrella, may it please the court. The facts of this case are relatively undisputed. Well, that brings me to my first question. You, you <laughs> wanted a hot panel, perhaps, and maybe not this hot <laughs> that early. Um, my question is whether or not this court has jurisdiction at this moment in time to consider this appeal. This is an appeal from an order entered by, I believe, Judge Hayes, denying the right to contest certain matters because of bankruptcy proceedings. There is yet no final judgment. Most of the cases that were cited in, in, and that I've read in this area suggest that this case, uh, this issue has come up in conjunction with the final judgment. So I'm not certain that I can pigeonhole this particular appeal into a non-final appealable order. And as it's not final in the case, because there's not been a final judgment of foreclosure, my concern is, do we have any jurisdiction, the power to do anything on this case? Um, I, and I know since you filed the appeal, you must have thought so. So I'm going to give you a chance to tell me why. I, I do believe that this court does have jurisdiction to hear this issue. And I believe that it is final as to Suzanne Centrella. I would liken it to if the court had officially struck her from the case as a party, uh, she would have the authority to appeal that decision. And that is essentially what the court did when it ruled that she has no ability to participate in the case and struck her answer in its entirety. At that point, the judicial resources were complete as to the defendant, Suzanne Centrella. She was no longer a party or a participant in the case. Therefore, all judicial resources were complete as to her interest. And I think at that point, it did become final to Suzanne Centrella, enabling her to bring that issue before the court, just as if she had been stricken from the case entirely. Um, I hope that answers your What does she have on the state of these pleadings? Um, since there's no final judgment yet either way, um, but I, I think another word, let me see if I can phrase it. If there was a counterclaim that alleged some sort of equitable relief or entitlement that flowed from conduct subsequent to the foreclosure proceeding, that is the you know, eviction of squatters, the expenditure of funds, you know, then I might be a little bit more concerned about the trial court's the exclusion of her from participating in the case. But the only pleadings that I saw in this file are an answer and affirmative defenses to exactly what happened in the, uh, the foreclosure, the offer to the bankruptcy court. I'm not sure I quite understand your honor's question. Well, if I, the I bankruptcy think... court and the federal 11th circuit case, which has been followed, um, governs and the trial court is correct as it applies to the re relinquishment of a uh, ownership of the property, theoretically. If you have an affirm, uh, a counterclaim or some sort of claim that says subsequent to this event, my client did A, B, and C for which we have arguably obtained rights, then I think I might say, see your complaint that, hey, you can't participate as being an infringement on your right to prosecute that which is subsequent to. But in terms of the universe created by the bankruptcy, I guess that's why I'm having my problem. And I have a second corollary problem for the appellee. And that is, why didn't you go ask the bankruptcy court to reopen the proceeding and do, do what you should you know, do to get the bankruptcy court to give you the order for the property? There's some, there's some federal cases on that point where reopening is permissible. But my concern is only right now, the immediate state of our pleadings, do we have the jurisdiction to look at it? And I guess you're saying the word unable to participate in any way in the future is overly broad? No, I, I think it's it's conclusive. It concludes her participation in the case. If this was an order on a, a, a motion to strike her participation in the case or a motion to dismiss her from the case, if the plaintiff had dismissed her from the case, um, that would be a conclusion. And I think the analysis as to whether or not something is final always looks at, is there any more judicial resources that will be expended with regards to Suzanne Centrella's defenses, claims, and, and participation in the case. And it came to a 
conclusion. It was final as to Suzanne Centrella. She was no longer a participant or a party in this case. And therefore, I think under the analysis of whether or not it's final, it is final. Um, clearly, the bank didn't challenge whether or not it was final on appeal, and the court has a right to determine that most, now. Most orders are interlocutory. This was not, for whatever reason, reduced to a summary judgment on the issue. It was an, it's an interlocutory order. And as I understand most interlocutory orders, they are subject to being revisited by the trial court which argues against it being some sort of final order that we would arguably have jurisdiction over. I mean, I, I think we're both seeing the concerns so, and I don't wanna take up 20 minutes on, on this. You know, your answer is the same, I've got it. <laughs> you know, I've, yeah. I, I've got the it. The answer is the, thing, is the same, Your Honor. I think it concluded the litigation as to a party and that party has a right to appeal it because it's final as to her. Um, Getting back to your honor to the facts of the case, as I stated, I think they're largely undisputed, but I think they're very important to the analysis of the issues on appeal. Nine years prior to this foreclosure case, Centrella files a chapter 13 bankruptcy, indicates an intent at the time to surrender to Bank of America home loans, not a current plaintiff. Um, she then moves out of the property and does what under any other circumstances the bank would laud her for doing. She contacts them, says I've, I've moved out, you can have the property, um, and she moves on with her life. Six years later, she gets contacted from the city and says, well, you actually still own the property. The property is now overrun with squatters and is dilapidated. She becomes concerned with her liability. Um, if someone were to get her on the property, there are crimes being committed on the property. And so she takes possession back of the property and spends $60,000 removing the squatters from the property and fixing the dilapidated condition of the property. Fast forward, the bank files its foreclosure action and then allows her to participate in the case for 18 months, saying nothing about the bankruptcy proceedings. She conducts discovery, files motions, files answers with the defenses, and it's not until they file the motion for protective order as to a certain set of discovery that for the first time they raise this issue of judicial estoppel based on the bankruptcy. That's followed up with the motion that resulted in this appeal, which is the motion for judicial estoppel under 1.140F. Uh, the court ultimately granted that motion despite the fact the bank had not filed any averment or defenses to the defendant's defenses, and in doing so, they struck her from the case, struck her answer, and opined that she had lost title upon filing of the bankruptcy and therefore had no reason to take back possession of the property. But for four reasons, this court should treat this as a final appeal and reverse the decision of the lower court. The first is that the vehicle by which the plaintiff brought their motion, 1.140, simply doesn't apply in these circumstances. It was based upon judicial estoppel, and I think we would all agree that judicial estoppel is a defense and the defense is waived if it's not raised. For whatever reason, the bank never filed any defenses to the defenses that were raised by, the, uh, by Ms. Centrella, and therefore it was waived. Next, 1.140F doesn't provide a mechanism for dismissing or striking pleadings on the basis of judicial estoppel. It's very clear and very limited on the grounds with which the court can strike pleadings. It lists them as being redundant, being immaterial, being impertinent, or being scandalous, or otherwise wholly irrelevant. The bank wants to now focus on the prong of wholly irrelevant, but uses a circular argument to do so. They're wholly irrelevant because she should be judicially stopped, and she's judicially stopped because they're wholly irrelevant. And that simply doesn't get them where they need to go. But even if this court were to overlook the fact that it was not pled and therefore waived, and even if this court were to overlook the fact that it's not appropriate under 1.440, instead it should have been a summary judgment, as Judge Castanueva pointed out, they simply didn't meet the five prongs. I wasn't making a ruling of law on that. I was making a, comp a par comparison. And, and, and I'll and get remember to that. that. Why, that's why only that would And even if it was my view, it's only one. <laughs> they have five prongs they had to prove for judicial estoppel, and they didn't meet any of them. The first is that the party against whom estoppel is sought must have had clearly inconsistent or conflicting positions. Ms. Centrella has never taken an inconsistent position. She elected to surrender the property to Bank of America, and nothing in the record suggests otherwise that she hasn't done that. Secondly, the position assumed in the former proceeding must have been successfully maintained. Well, there's a big question of fact here as to that. What the bank asked the court to take judicial notice of was her initial bankruptcy filing, which did include an intent to surrender the property to Bank of America. But on closer examination on the confirmed plan Exhibit A, which lists the properties which were surrendered to creditors, this property is not included. So there's a big question there as to whether or not she was actually successful in the bankruptcy. And that's never been decided by the court. Third, the proceedings both have to involve the same parties, which we don't have here. 
And four and five, the party seeking relief must have been misled by the former position and the party seeking estoppel must have changed their position. Nothing in the plaintiff's motion for judicial estoppel made an allegation as to either of those prongs. And so the motion should not have been granted by the court. It's not an appropriate motion. What it really was is a motion for summary judgment. But because it was really should have been a motion for summary judgment, I had no sworn evidence before the court. The only sworn evidence before the court was the verified statement of Ms. Centrella. And so at best, the motion should have been denied because plaintiff didn't meet their burden. And at worst, there were issues of fact that should have precluded granting a judgment on that particular issue. The second reason why the lower court should be reversed is because the doctrine of latches applies. Latches requires two things, lack of diligence by a party against whom the defense is asserted. I don't think anyone can say there was a lack of diligence here when nine years passes between when a defendant not only makes it uh, available to the bank to foreclose, but notifies them that she's vacated the property. Um, and they Do sit we on have their... a trial court order on the issue of latches? We don't, Your Honor. The only well, order how do we that we then, have... How does this court then review it? It was argued as part of our opposition to the motion that's on appeal. Uh, it was preserved in so her... So the argument is that the trial court should have heard, taken evidence on the theory of latches Absolutely. and then made a determination. Absolutely. If they were going to take counsel's unsworn statements on the issue of judicial estoppel, they should have taken the defendant's sworn statements on the issue of latches. Um, the second prong of latches is that there was prejudice to the party who's asserting it. Clearly, there was prejudice here. Um, they held her hostage for nine years, dragging her back into this property because of a fear that she was going to be liable should somebody get hurt or injured, um, or be, she'd be fined by the city for the condition of the property. Um, and that's really an unreasonable request for somebody who has uh, discharged this in bankruptcy, indicated intent to surrender, and done everything they can to get out of the way of the bank, to drag her back into the tune of $60,000 to protect herself um, is really a prejudice. And that's the prong that the trial court really got wrong. The trial court said, well, there can't be any prejudice here because as soon as you file the bankruptcy, title transferred. And admittedly, the bank has admitted in their answer brief that was a wrong statement. Um, the title did not change hands and it does not change hands until the bank uh, finishes its foreclosure. And we only have to look at the Corriganus court, who, who setting aside that this case was a nine-year delay and a five-year delay, the court ruled that the bank had slept on its rights and that the doctrine of latches applied. What's very ironic about this issue is in response to us raising latches, they say, well, you didn't raise latches as an affirmative defense, setting aside that they didn't raise judicial estoppel as a defense to our defenses. This issue was not raised as an affirmative defense to the underlying action, the foreclosure. Ms. Centrella is not seeking to prevent them from filing a foreclosure on the, on the theory of latches. She's simply raising it in response to a bank using judicial estoppel as a sword and trying to prevent her from participating in the case and saying, you're not the bank that I surrendered the property to. There's a standing issue here. And so it would not have been raised as a defense to the complaint, but only became a relevant defense when they raised their motion for judicial estoppel. Third, in order to come to the conclusion that the lower court reached, we necessarily have to retroactively apply a very concrete strict definition of surrender that didn't exist for six years until six years after the notice of intent to surrender was filed. In fact, at the time that Ms. Centrella indicated an intent to surrender, that definition was not defined in the bankruptcy code, and it was subject to multiple interpretations depending on which county you practice in and which litigator you spoke with. It could mean anything from dissolving the automatic stay, but leaving you free to contest things like standing in the trial court, to reverting it back to the bankruptcy trustee, who then makes the determination of, am I going to sell this property or am I going to give it back to the homeowner? It was not until the what they've called the landmark decision of FIELA in 2016 that the court applied this very strict definition um, to, the, to the term of surrender in the context of a bankruptcy. And in fact, courts in two different proceedings have elected not to apply this definition to bankruptcies that were filed significantly before that landmark decision, and that's Henry Townsend and Henry Ayala. And fourth, Your Honor, the promise to surrender to one entity has never been extended to include a promise to surrender to just anyone. Um, if that were the case, it would invite anyone, including somebody, a thief, to come forward on a property that has been surrendered and file bankruptcy, knowing that the debtor has their hands tied and cannot raise this issue of standing. The court has not extended that to that extreme, um, and it would be nonsensical to do so. And so for all of these reasons, the court should reverse the lower court's final decision um, and allow Ms. Centrella to participate in the underlying foreclosure. Thank you, counsel. And you're well in advance of your 17 minute warning. You're at 14 and a half. Okay, I'll make the notation here and uh, I'll stop the clock.
and uh, okay, Mr. Ruff, I, I think we're ready to hear your presentation, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Um, may it please the court. My name is Michael Ruff. I'm with the Paget Law Group, uh, representing the appellee. Um, uh, just very briefly, um, Mr. Ruff, when the debtor in bankruptcy surrenders the property, do they not surrender it to the trustee and to the owner of the property, the mortgage holder? Uh, Your Honor, it's a surrender to both creditor, uh, to the trustee and to the, to the trustee first. And if the trustee does not do anything with it, the trustee abandons, abandons it, then it is to the creditor. Okay. Um, and but, so why isn't the creditor getting an order from the bankruptcy court to saying that none of the processes of Section 521 has been completed? The surrender now goes to the creditor? Your the Honor, bankruptcy court has the ability to reopen their case, and this has nothing to impact any rights of any other party. It's just simply a matter of transferring the uh, legal interest to your client. Why isn't that something can be done by the bankruptcy court? Sure, Your Honor. Uh, I guess for, to, as an initial uh, point to that, um, surrender does not mean transfer of title. Um, so to briefly to Ms. Uh, Lundergan- it, it certainly enhance your legal interest to have the order well, of the absolutely. bankruptcy yes, court. Sir. Yes, sir. But it, uh, uh, surrender means simply that they can no longer contest uh, the foreclosure uh, by any subsequent creditors. In order to get title, foreclosure must still happen. Now, what has happened in the, the case law is, frankly, uh, both things are covered. Um, there are ample cases, the Townsend case, the Ayala case, um, uh, the Miss Lunigan cites to, where pr foreclosing lenders do indeed go back to the bankruptcy court and seek an order uh, and that, that was the case in the Phila case. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Phila and uh, the Metzler case, um, where the uh, foreclosing lender is seeking a uh, <clears throat> reopening of the bankruptcy case for the bankruptcy court to enforce the surrender and to issue an order saying that the uh, borrower, uh, the debtor, is uh, stopped from contesting the foreclosure further in the state court. But there's also plenty of state court cases from this very district, uh, the Lewis v. Inova case, the BMG case, uh, the Fisher case, where this court, the Second District Court of Appeal, has uh, has stated that uh, estoppel and, and a, a defendant's, a borrower's ability to contest a foreclosure in the state court is precluded if they indeed have surrendered. Now, the difference with Fisher is there was a little bit stricter standard in terms of it, uh, Fisher, the court declined to, to enforce that because it was not clear as to the surrender. Um, but in the Inova case and the BMG case, it was clear. Our position would be that it is clear in this instance that there was surrender. There was uh, an admission of surrender in the uh, initial brief. Uh, as well the concerns as I have, and obviously I'm not a bankruptcy practitioner, although I did have the pleasure of appearing before Judge Pasquet on several occasions. The uh, FILA opinion cited, if I recall correctly, with approval, a middle district opinion called Guerra or Guerra. And in that case, Guerra, there was talk about a lapse of time, uh, inconsistent positions, and they would leave that then in terms of judicial estoppel for the surrender to the state court. If that's the correct interpretation of the law, can the trial judge here prohibit the contesting of acts that are not related to surrender. That is a, a total, you know, uh, I forget the word counsel for the appellant used, but a total, you can't do anything. And it seems that maybe, you know, FIA by citing this case with approval says where time has gone by, lapses are in there, there's inconsistent statements. Perhaps the debtor can challenge the state courts because that decision out of the middle district says it is left to the state courts. And again, I'm not a bankruptcy practitioner and I'm trying to make sense of these rules that I don't use every day. And I wanna make sure I'm consistent on behalf of the court. So does that mean the trial judge erred? If, if that decision is correct because of time and inconsistent positions, they should be allowed? Your Honor, and, and again, Your Honor, I, I, to a certain degree, I don't disagree with, with what you're saying. Um, the case law is to a certain degree all over the place. Um, I would also, as kind of as the same point that Guerra makes, the, the Kurogenis case uh, that Ms. Lundergan brought up, that was another instance where a foreclosing lender, uh, if, if I recall correctly, uh, tried to get a bankruptcy court to reopen uh, 
a, a bankruptcy order in order to enforce. Uh, the bankruptcy court declined, but then they decided to Was latches. that the one about five years and debtor's husband? Correct. And okay, but, good, because I didn't remember the name of it. I just remember I saw it. <laughs> The, the, the Kurogenis case is bankruptcy court case, a bankruptcy court order, um, where they declined to reopen and the bankruptcy court cited to latches. But importantly, in Kurogenis, um, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, I'm not quoting, so forgive me. Uh, the Kurogenis the case, uh, the bankruptcy court was very careful to say that the latches prohibits the bankruptcy court from being reopened. But um, and specifically the bankruptcy, but also specifically that the bankruptcy court cannot exercise jurisdiction over the state court. Um, the Kurgenis uh, court, uh, the bankruptcy court, then goes on to state um, or suggest, excuse me, no, and again I'm paraphrasing. Um, they suggest that the debtor can still can could still challenge standing, but the borrower does not get a free pass either. Um, and this is a quote uh, from. You can't uh, have your cake and eat it too. Exactly, Your Honor. Yeah, uh, I saw the quote. Yes, sir. I was, she could be confronted in, in brackets in the state court. Well, here, here's case. my concern reading from a 2018 case out of the Orlando division called McHale. When a debtor says he is going to surrender his home and then continues to fight a foreclosure closure action, in most cases, the appropriate remedy is for the bankruptcy court to squelch the debtor's defenses. And that's why I kind of prompted some of my questions. Is this something that should be handled by reopening the bankruptcy case, let them determine surrender, and then the state court applies uh, under supremacy or whatever the bankruptcy court rulings? Your Honor, I, I would I would suggest that that's one way to do it. Um, okay, and like I said, but it's not the, mandatory. Be your argument. I, I believe it's not mandatory. The Lewis case and the B and G case, both from this district uh, court of appeal. Um, there was no indication in my read of the cases that there was an order from the bankruptcy court. It was it was in the trial court. The trial court had said that estoppel applies. Well, a lot of times, you know, when we start our analysis, we start with the then existing cases, and that would have been FIA, Judge Pryor's decision Correct. for the panel. And obviously, the federal courts generate interpretive stuff that is subsequent to that, that is now being brought to our attention. And so we have to figure out whether or not we are going to carve anything out, follow or whatever. And that's what's prompted some of my questions. And I appreciate both counsel bearing with me as uh, I, I attempt to uh, learn some degree of bankruptcy law and apply it to Florida proceedings. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Ruff, let me ask you this. So you have talked about the surrender and how Ms. Uh, Centralis shouldn't be able to participate. I'd like to hear what your position is to what Ms. Lundergan was saying with regard to her necessity to come back and get involved, not necessarily fighting the foreclosure aspects or whether she should get title, but when you've got a code enforcement board who's coming after them and the bank is sitting there just expecting someone else to do it because they're not the party at interest. How is it that your client should behave in that situation versus the interest of the person who's still the record title holder. Sure. Uh, and your honor, I, I, I think if I'm understanding correctly, what you're essentially talking is a policy argument. Um, no, I'm asking you from, from the law, what is it that you say? Is it your position that under the law, the way it is, that the surrender is the surrender and Ms. Lundergan's uh, argument is for not her client is just out of it. I, I saw in your brief, you argued she could have moved back in. She could have continued living there. But if somebody is living someplace and that needs a new roof that costs $20,000, but they know a foreclosure could start in a day, that they're not likely to do that. How long is it your position that that doesn't matter? They shouldn't be able to be a party to even make that claim in a subsequent foreclosure action, no matter how long the bank waits. You know, I'm, I mean, certainly sympathetic to to her arguments, uh, just as a, as a human being. But under the law, uh, the surrender does not transfer title. Um, she just as she moved out to allow the the the, for, the bank does not get title. A creditor does not get title from surrender. A separate action must be filed. The foreclosure action. Right. Um, Miss uh, uh, Miss Centrala moved out uh, purportedly. Um, 
to allow the bank to take over, but the bank can't simply take over. The bank is not entitled. The, the bank is not does not have a legal interest in the property other than as a lien holder, unless and until they file foreclosure. You're arguing though that surrender should keep her from participating. But if the facts of the situation as they arise give credence to the fact that she should be able to participate because the bank's inaction, latches or whatever, has caused her to have to suffer additional damages based on her having to go out of pocket, her having to evict somebody, why shouldn't they be allowed to be a party to well, make those arguments to the trial court? And, and if I may, Your Honor, two points on that. The first one is the trial court did address that uh, in its ruling. Um, I don't recall the exact page, but it's the, the end of the, uh, of, of, the, of the transcript of the trial. It's in the record. And the judge essentially said, um, I believe that some of this may or should have been a separate action, a counterclaim, et cetera, uh, for, uh, and, I'm, and I'm going from memory here, but I believe for set off or a separate action for damages for, for what she paid out because of the, you know, the alleged inaction by the bank. Um, so but the that's second the point, case, you know, before you go there, though, then under your argument that surrender is surrender and she shouldn't be able to participate, you're now saying, had there been a counterclaim, you would agree that they would be able to participate. I think that's what the trial court was saying, was uh, suggesting, if you will. But uh, well, that, wouldn't the remedy have been to, to direct her to file a counterclaim? I mean, well, you throw somebody, essentially you throw somebody out of court because they sought the wrong, you think they sought the wrong remedy? Isn't, isn't the answer, if you think someone's seeking the wrong remedy, to treat them as if they've sought the right remedy or direct them to file the appropriate pleading, not exclude them from court. Well, I think the court did suggest that as regards Ms. Centrala. Um, I, I How's she know. gonna do that now? She uh, could certainly move the court to do same. Um, but I would also suggest as far as the, 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 the amount of time that has passed, this court in the BMG case spoke specifically as to, and citing the Cone Brothers case, that there is no requirement that a bank uh, move at the will of any third party, including a borrower, in order to move up the timetable for foreclosure of its, of its, uh, or its foreclosure case. The bank can elect for its own when to choose to enforce its lien, when to file a foreclosure. That's the, the, this court's BMG case citing to the Cone Brothers case. Um, uh, so that, that so was you're suggesting that our, our prior decisions should bind us that under all circumstances, no matter how long a bank waits, the bank waits 15 years, somebody's got to go put a new roof on it, they get liens from uh, their local code enforcement that can be enforced against their other properties, serve as a judgment, none of that matters the bank gets 100% carte blanche to decide when they want to go forward. No, nothing, nothing to suggest that there's carte blanche by any means. Um, but again, this is a court, the lower court foreclosure is a court sitting in equity. And what you have to look at are the balance of the equities. And for example, um, one of the issues here is that. In, if you're uh, balancing the equities, how are they going to balance the equities if one of the parties isn't even allowed to be there? Well, your honor, my client, the appellee here, should have been a party to the original bankruptcy. They should have been listed as a creditor. They were not. Uh, there was an assignment of mortgage recorded in the public records that indicated the appellee as the assignee of the mortgage, and that assignment of mortgage also transferred the note to the appellee recorded in the public records in 2009. The bankruptcy was filed in 2011. Under 695.11, the uh, recording of any document in the public records is noticed to all persons of whatever interest that might be. So uh, Ms. Centrala and her bankruptcy in 2011 was represented by counsel. They, the, for whatever reason they listed, and there's not any statement in the record as to why they named BAC uh, America Home Loans, and I uh, may get the name wrong here, forgive me, uh, but no reason given in the record as to why they named that particular entity as the creditor. But the simple fact is they should have named the appellee. The appellee had a valid legal interest in the property by virtue of the assignment of mortgage, as well as the note 
two years before bankruptcy was filed. So to balance the equities, Your Honor, I would suggest it's not equitable that Ms. Centrala gets to make a mistake, whether inadvertent or deliberate, not name the proper party as a creditor of the bankruptcy. And then when the, pro when the pro party that should have been named comes forward in their foreclosure six years later and tries to say, you surrender the property, you are stopped, they bring up the argument, this is the, uh, the, the same party argument, uh, that, well, you're not the party we surrendered to. Therefore, you don't get to make that argument. The argument that uh, I named, and if again, paraphrasing here, but I named the wrong party. Uh, I did not name the right party, but that doesn't matter uh, because you weren't named, you don't get to uh, bring up these bankruptcy issues. Um, and that would also bring into the, uh, uh, the judicial estoppel rules, uh, not rules, but the guidelines, one of which being the mutuality of parties uh, requirement for judicial estoppel, but the Bloomberg exception to the mutuality of parties, uh, which is uh, uh, the, 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 the exception that says that they have to be the same party under special circumstances. So this is the case where uh, well, let me phrase it to, to you, Mr. Ruff, as I phrase it to counsel for the appellant. It would seem, you know, and, and this ties into what Judge Stargell was bringing up and Judge Kelly, that had there been an opportunity to plead, um, you know, for a resulting trust or equitable lien or whatever on conduct passing, that FIA would not bar their participation in the case because it's only as to the turnover of the property, you know, that which they promised to do in bankruptcy, the surrender. And this is conduct subsequent to. And my concern is I read Judge Hayes's order. It says um, it's a final order to, uh, has, a, has her ability to litigate in this case. And then the next paragraph three is interesting. It says the affirmative defenses and the jury trial demand are stricken and defendant is precluded from contesting the plaintiff's for, foreclosure action. If that, that would then suggest that her answer still stands because it only strikes the affirmative defenses and jury demand. So her answer is still there. That's how I would read it, Your Honor. So that would mean she still is a party and could seek to amend her pleadings to assert whatever latches argument or anything else like that. And that would then, I guess, circle me back to whether or not this is really, in fact, a final order, despite its claim to be a final order. You know, I, I'm concerned because I think FIA doesn't answer every permutation that can happen in terms of, as Judge Stargell pointed out, you wait four or five years, rightly or wrongly, not your fault, nobody's fault. But something may happen that impacts the appellant's chance to be heard. Because if appellant is correct that they improved the property and they're giving an award, maybe that offsets the amount of damages due, and that may, in fact, the ability to redeem at a foreclosure sale. I mean, there's a lot of permutations here that, at this stage, we haven't got to, but you can see them over the horizon. Um, sure, and and your and I, I understand the the what you're saying, Your Honor, and what the, the the point the court's making. But but again, I would go back to the whole issue of. Surrender does not mean transfer of title. There's no requirement that they abandon the property. There's no requirement they move out. He chose to do that. That was a volunteer. Um, when, as the, the the initial brief stated, when she found out that she was still entitled, well, she is entitled. That's the surrender. Bankruptcy does not convey title. So she was entitled from the get go, and that's the whole reason the foreclosure case is filed. So the 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 aspect of of you know, she moved out, she moved back in, she has $60,000 in damages, et cetera. You know, the, the same argument can be made conversely, which I did in my answer brief, that you know, there was no requirement to do that. This was a volunteer. She could have stayed there and, you know, she got the benefit of, of you know, there, our complaint alleged that no payments had been made and, uh, and all subsequent payments, that the payments were not being made. And to my knowledge, they still haven't been made. Um, Your Honor, how much time do I have left? Um, we are at 1920, but I'm going to give you an extra two minutes since we have been rather, what's the phrase from the old movie, vigorous in our questioning. <laughs> I think that I, was the I, second like Zara being, movie as a dancer. It's quite vigorous. I, I, well, I like being busy uh, more so than otherwise. I get nervous when the court's silent. Um, yeah. So we're proving that we're really engaged on this case. 
Yes, sir. Um, if I may, just to, to briefly, because I do have a limited time just to sum up, um, I, I would uh, point again that the, we, we didn't talk about it much, but that aspect of the assignment of mortgage, assigning the mortgage and note both being of record two years before filing bankruptcy, that is critical. That is important. Um, the, the, by virtue of the chapter 695 Florida statutes, uh, Ms. Centrala was on notice. She was represented by counsel in the bankruptcy. Um, you know, to, to, to say, again, to, to get to your honor's point, if can't have your cake and eat it too, that's what they're trying to do here. Uh, they didn't name us in the bankruptcy. They should have. Um, and, and now one of their arguments is you weren't a creditor, you weren't listed, therefore you can't make this argument. Um, and it's up to the debtor to list the people on the schedules, is my recollection. Correct. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the appellee was not involved in the in the bankruptcy whatsoever because they weren't listed as a creditor. If you look at the list of creditors, uh, the appellee is not listed. Um, uh, as to uh, again, latches here does not apply for the same reasons. Uh, the the bank can exercise on its own discretion when to uh, file its foreclosure action. That's per uh, be the you know this court's B and G case, uh, citing two Cone brothers. Um, the Curragenis case did find that latches applies, but that's in the context of the court coming back, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the foreclosing lender coming back to the bankruptcy court to try to reopen. The bankruptcy court said latches applies because it's been too long since the bankruptcy court has been closed. Your more appropriate remedy um, is to, uh, you need, it, it says uh, estoppel is not, uh, you can't plead estoppel in the first court. That would be the bankruptcy court. Estoppel must be pled in the second court before closing. That's one thing that Corrigina said. And so that's what we did here. That's what the Lewis case did. That's what the BMG case did, um, was pleading the estoppel aspect in the second court, the state court, based on what the bankruptcy court had previously decided, i.e. the surrender. Um, well, counsel, we're at the, the extended time. So why don't you take 30 seconds to give us your final close? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just very briefly um, as to, and then I do appreciate the, the extra time. Um, as to the, the, and this is really just to, to clean things up. I mentioned this in my answer brief. When the, the judge uh, in the, in the uh, hearing talked about transfer title, I think you know, we made it clear in our answer brief as well as here today that for, uh, surrender does not transfer title. I think that was a slip of the tongue um, by the, the trial judge, uh, the hearing judge. Uh, the proper action when uh, surrendered. If it had been a transfer title, then foreclosure wouldn't be necessary. I mean, the, the court case law is clear that foreclosure must must be had after uh, after uh, surrender. And thank you for the course time. Thank you, counsel. Thank you for uh, hanging in there with us. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Counsel, we're going to return back to the appellant. Your mic is muted, so you may want to unmute it before you start. Uh, let me fix the clock and. Um, you stopped at 14 and a half, so that would normally give you four and a half minutes if my math is good. And I don't warrant that in any way. Since I gave counsel an extra two, you will have the same amount of time. Thank you, Your Honor. And I'm only gonna try to make four brief points and I'll leave some time if the court has any follow-up questions. Um, in no particular order with regards to the assignment. One of the few things I heard counsel say that we can agree to is the assignment is important. The assignment is important and it was the basis for fighting the foreclosure on the affirmative defense of standing. Uh, counsel's testimony that the assignment is valid or legally enforceable uh, is not evidence before the court, and that should have been heard and vetted by the court in the underlying substantive merits. Um, there's no evidence before the court as to who was the owner at the time that she filed the bankruptcy, whether Bank of America stayed on as a servicer, whether the plaintiff in this case was aware of the underlying bankruptcy. Those are all facts that are not before the court, and so counsel's testimony doesn't fill in those gaps. With regards to um, alluding for the first time that the defendant could somehow go back and assert potentially counterclaims or additional arguments, that flies in the face of paragraph two of the order, which says that the court finds defendant Suzanne Centrella is hereby precluded from further litigating in the pending proceeding in any manner. Uh, that's conclusive. That doesn't leave the door open for coming in and filing counterclaims. And I'm sure we'd get a motion for sanctions if we had done that after this order was entered. So there's no question that the door was, was completely closed for Suzanne Centrella contesting the foreclosure in any manner. Um, next, Your Honor, with regards to the issue of, of the prejudice, counsel seems to indicate that the bank can just sit on their rights, potentially sit on their rights forever. 
but that doesn't come without the risk. The risk that at some point, as Cora Gaines said, they set the bar at five years. At five years, you've sat on your rights enough where there is some sort of latches here. Um, I'm fearful that if the court were to rule today that we should go back to the court and try to reopen the bankruptcy, that if the bankruptcy court declines to do that, Ms. Centrella has no remedy at law to overturn this particular order. Um, and because of the amount of time that has passed, the bank never did that, and I'm, I'm fearful that the court would choose not to do that. But there has clearly been prejudice to Ms. Centrella. There is no question that when a debtor goes into the bankruptcy court and chooses to surrender a property, it's because they no longer want the financial risk and responsibility of that property. And the bank held her hostage for nine years, even though she did everything. She would have been lauded for her actions. She contacted, she said, I've moved out, here it is, I'm getting out of your way, file your foreclosure. But they took the risk of sitting on their rights for nine years, forcing her to respond to code enforcement, forcing her to remove squatters, forcing her to fix the property so that she didn't get sued for a property that she wanted to get rid of nine years prior. So there's no question here that there was prejudice. The lower court completely erred in finding that the property transferred upon filing the bankruptcy and therefore there could have not have been prejudice. All of these issues merit reversal. Um, they should have been vetted by the trial court. And, and clearly if the wrong entity comes forward to try to foreclose a property, the court should and could have heard this issue on the issue of standing. Um, she did surrender to Bank of America, but if a different entity comes along and there is a reasonable belief to believe that that party does not have standing, that's an issue that the court should want to hear. Um, so for all these reasons, we would ask that the court reverse the lower court's decision. My concern before we, we let you go is I look at this order that you were citing and indeed in paragraph two, uh, the trial court order says that uh, the defendant is hereby precluded from further litigating in the pending proceeding in any manner due to her bankruptcy. Now the bankruptcy is, is arguably inferentially from that is a question of who is entitled to have title vested in them through a foreclosure proceeding. Um, do I, can I limit, can, is it appropriate to us to interpret the court's order saying that all this has to do is with the ability to surrender the property and not because it doesn't strike the answer in paragraph three, just affirmative defenses and not amounts due. I, I, I mean, don't know how the yeah, I don't know. Under I mean, the nobody wrote it and told me. Yeah. It's subject know to, you know, the... is that an ambiguity latent or pain that I don't know what? I don't think the order is ambiguous at all. I think the court intended that Suzanne Chantrella shall have no participation in the case. Oh. To say that, well, she can't have defenses, but she can have an answer. I, I, I don't know how we can interpret that as that. That would still be participation in the case. Um, and so unless the court's willing to vacate this and, and provide some sort of instruction to the lower court, to me, this order is not ambiguous. It doesn't leave any door open. And I'm not willing to risk getting sanctioned by trying to go back to the court and raise a counterclaim when they told me I cannot participate in this case. Well, I know the court did not strike the answer and um, just the uh, affirmative defenses and uh, the demand for a jury trial. And I'll have to go back through the pleadings again to see what the affirmative defense is related to, to see if interpretively, you know, I can uh, make the text work because it may be one thing of what we intended and another thing, what we actually did. Um, but I, I thank you for your responses as well. Um, it's been an interesting time. And uh, I'll, I will let you know, counsel, that long time ago, um, I appeared as an advocate before Judge Hayes. So uh, that's how old I am. He was a county court judge at the time. And then an acting circuit judge. So um, he and I have been around for a while as, as some of our people. So I know exactly who Judge Hayes is and I think the world of him. But, you know, our job is something else here. And I thank you for bearing with us and all, because this is an interesting uh, intersection of bankruptcy law and the right to litigate in the state courts. I thank you all, and please be safe, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you, thank you very much, Your Honors. Y'all have a great day. You too. Okay. Uh, the third case is Bonini.